So one of my cats is really big and really fat. Uh, she's not fat. She's just really, really fluffy. Like she's huge. And um, they're not like young cats anymore. They're like 11. So they're like senior cats. And the other day she was limping. Just like, like she jumped off the sofa and she was limping. And I was like, oh shit, I'm going to have to take it to the vet. What if she's got arthritis and like like all this, this like panic mode just kind of like went through me about having to take the cat to the vet during pandemic times um but then I realized that she only limps if someone's looking at her <laughs> <laughs> no word of a lie so sometimes when she walks past me if I'm sitting on the sofa I close my eyes to pretend I don't see her it's like a game we play it's very sad I'm very I love my cats I'm just a weirdo I did it the other day and well yesterday I did it and um she just walked straight past me and I opened my eyes as she walked like just past me and she just wasn't limping at all and I was like you bitch so I was like hey come here like and so she turned around and she like, limps towards me oh my god I was like oh my right god. so so she's still going to the vet because she has to go to the vet about this because I'm worried that she's got some sort of like psychosomatic problem but like my cat is fake limping this is i'm sorry i'm not gonna laugh but it's really funny (laughs) it's hilarious we've been testing it as well it's not like it's just like one off or occasionally she limps because occasionally she's in pain it's like every single time she thinks you can't see her she will walk perfectly fine have you checked your cameras because i know like you have cameras in your house to check on yeah, your cats. Yeah, really, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Home security cameras, not not cat surveillance. <laughs> I mean, not really, because they haven't been on because we've been home Fair all one. the time. But um, now I'm going to set up, like, I'm going to move them around the house. Can like, you set up, level. like, a sting operation and then, like, yeah. report back? Yeah. And I'm it can gonna, be, like, gonna, our true crime news of the week. <laughs> I'm going to do, like, a raid. I'm so angry at her. I want to know why she's doing it. What a sneaky bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Cats are so petty, man. Yeah. Maybe she's just sick of us being at home. Yeah. She's actually trying to get herself, like, to the vet. So she's like, I need, to get, I need a freaking break. She's like, like so I'm going to fake an injury so they leave me at the vet. <laughs> Harsh. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Murder Friends, the podcast where three friends from three different countries talk about murder. My name's Alana, and I'm Canadian. I'm Anna, and I'm American. My name's Hannah, and I'm British. So sit back and relax. You're among friends, and let's talk murder. So how are you guys doing? We are on week um, 932 (laughs) of coronavirus 19, and now more developments across the world. Yeah, I hate the whole... um we're going to get a second spike in coronavirus because all these people are protesting. And it's like, um, I doubt it. I think it's more to do with all the people that just like flocked to the beaches. Yeah. Mm, And all those parks where everybody's crowded in. Exactly. So maybe just be a bit more critical of the media (laughs) if you see things like that. I know. But that is the thing though with a lot of it is they just focus in on something like, Oh, never mind all this good that's going on over here. We're just going to show you this one crappy little thing and, like, blow it up and, Mm. you know, know, I guess that's the media the world over. But anyway, it's been, um, it's been, like, a hard few weeks. I think the lockdown's getting to people as well. Yeah, it is. Your cat, number one. She's so stressed. I know. Things are luckily, okay, so, like, over in England, Boris announced yesterday, so we can... They're, they are reopening non-essential shops next week. So when you listen to this, they will have been open for a couple of days. And I've noticed in town, because I live in town, that there there's lots of people in shops like moving stuff around and putting arrows. And they've put arrows like all over, like even in the town on just like the just the pavement, like just where you're mm. supposed to walk. It's wild. But it's also weird how used to it you get like really quickly. Because even stuff at, like the supermarket, like I'm just like, yeah, whatever. Like it's not really like phase me anymore but then also stuff like I think if you're a single adult in England or like a single parent with kids you can like join another like join family for oh you can form a a social bubble bubbles yeah we got that here in Canada too but not like not just two families you have to be like somebody basically that needs other like like adult 
support and companionship. Yeah, I can imagine, like, if you lived on your own, it'd be really tough. Yeah, so we actually... Not to have, like, not to have someone to... Oh, can you imagine for, like, three months? Yeah. Yeah. So we... My brother-in-law is on his own. And so, you know, like, after he... Boris said that yesterday, I obviously sent some text message in our little three-way group chat with my husband and was like, you know, do you want to be in our bubble? Like, oh. <laughs> you know, like, and then I was all nervous. Like, what if he said no? <laughs> like, like mm, sorry. He's like, no, I've got other friends. <laughs> I've got like other people's <laughs> bubbles that I'd rather be in, but luckily he said yes. So we avoided some sort of awkward situation. So that's exciting. So it will be really nice to be able to see him again. And my daughter's really close to him. So she's been missing him like crazy. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, like, I guess little baby steps were getting there, kind of. What about what's going on in Canada? I think we were somewhat more open than you guys in that you could still do takeout. You could still go to restaurants and get curbside service. So pretty much any like restaurant, I know lots of them in town that obviously can't have any customers. They all mm. resorted to um, st- some started doing delivery or all of them at least were doing like curbside service. So you could still like, you know, go to McDonald's or get uh, takeout from a restaurant, that kind of stuff. I know they're now opening pretty much any, I want to say any store that has an en- like its own entrance. Places in a mall can't open unless you have an entrance like on the outside. But um, mm. like clothing stores are opening now so people can, I think the rule is you can try on clothes at a store as long as the change rooms have hard surface doors. Like, they're very specific rules, I guess, in that instance. So the the store can, like, wipe down all the change room doors and whatever. But, yeah, things, I think, have been more open here for the most part than what you guys have been going through. It sounds pretty similar to us, I think. I think maybe we're a little bit uh, tougher here, a little bit, but... Yeah, like, we could... You couldn't... You didn't have to have, like, one walk. Like, there was no restrictions on, like, how many times you can go out or some people have been going for drives, you know, to get out and, like, walk in different areas and whatever, and that's okay. So I think, I mean, not a whole lot has changed, but I know they're starting to sort of inch things a little bit closer, but still, like, larger areas. I know, like, Toronto and some of the bigger cities around here are not lessening restrictions because they're so populated and, and whatever. So it is also dependent and not just like province wide, but like town wide where you are yeah. and everything. So it's a little bit confusing because you're not really sure like who's open. What are you actually allowed to do now? Can you go, could, could you go to that uh, one place or is that because the doors aren't the quite, quite right door? Like it's, it's a little bit confusing wow. now, but yeah, it's it's sort of like that. But actually, so the the non-essential stores aren't allowed to open still for a few days. But um, if you live in England, you'll know what a mat's land is. So oh, I gosh. went in, <laughs> I went in there because I was struggling. My daughter went back to school, so they sent back kindergarten or I say kindergarten or foundation year one and year six students, and so she's gone back. But about ha- only like half the students went back, but we sent her back. They're actually not wearing uniforms at the minute. So I don't know why. I think it's because they want them to be able to wash their clothes every single day and like nobody have to wear like a jumper or something. So they scrapped uniforms for like this term. And so, but I realized like I just done a huge clear out of her wardrobe because obviously lockdown, who didn't? And <laughs> also she had grown and I just needed some like really sort of like shorts and like crappy things I could send her in that she could mm-hmm. just wear to school that wasn't like a dress <laughs> or whatever. So I ventured into Madeleine and then you're like in these like one way systems they've put down on the floor and a lot of, you know, like they do in the, in like the grocery store too. But then I realized I was accidentally go, it was really confusing because it's quite big. This one's really big. And I realized going the wrong way against the arrows and it was like sheer panic. Uh-huh. I know, oh my I God. know. Please, oh no. <laughs> please don't tell. You're lucky tell you it. didn't get hurt. <laughs> and it was like sheer panic until I could get find an arrow going the right way. And then like, you know, it was just like. It's oh. so funny how that's like a thing that you think about. Because like I went to the LCBO, which is like where you buy your booze here in Ontario. And <laughs> um, so there's a lineup outside because, of course, and you, everybody's, you know, lining up apart from each other, which is nice. And there's this one poor guy at the door almost like in riot gear so people like he was like fully covered 
with the the plastic shield on the face and he's got his gloves and his mask and he's holding this giant bottle of like spray (laughs) hand sanitizer and he's standing there and he's dripping sweat because it's so hot out and he's got like full pants and like long sleeves and everything and I'm standing there I'm like waiting for him to let me in right to get the nod that you can go in and I was like, I'm so sorry, buddy. Like, that looks like it sucks. And he's like, it does suck. It does so suck awesome. a lot. <laughs> and so he, um, he, he's like, okay, you can go in. He sprays my hands. And then, of course, there's the arrows on the floor. And I was going, I wanted to get some ciders. So I'm following the arrows. And they take you through the whole store. And the cider's at the very end. So I was like, well, I, am I allowed to cut through? Probably, like, I'm not really sure. So I'm just going to follow the arrows because I'm too nervous. So I follow the arrows all the way through the store and I finally kind of get to the cider area. And it's not like a huge store, so the aisles are quite small. And there's a guy standing there and I needed to get past him. And it's like, what's the protocol? Do you just squeeze past as fast as you can or do you like wait till they move? But he can't go backwards because that would be against the arrows. And then I'm standing there like (laughs) holding my little basket, like having a little panic. Like, what do I pass him? Do I not? Like... (laughs) It's so strange. It is. Those I don't even need those visors though. The visors, they're it's quite, quite daunting, you know? They're like to like you're you're just in your normal like self, like maybe a mask or whatever, but it's just like, oh. I was watching one of those uh as seen on TV, like one of those types of commercials, and there's a company now that sells them that attach to like a baseball hat. I must have seen the commercial like four hundred times. It's on constantly. So you can buy a little face shield that attaches to your baseball you clip hat. Them on. Yeah, it's That's like amazing. a clip on shield. That's so the most North American thing I've ever yeah. heard of. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, modern problems, modern solutions. I That's love it just though. fantastic. So today for True Crime News, we've actually, over the last couple of weeks, had some huge case breaks in stories. Really grim and terrible, so I apologize now. <laughs> I think I'm going to start with the a huge one that's happened first. I'm going to start with the Lori Vallow case. And there was a huge break just yesterday from when we were recording. Two sets of human remains were found at Vallow's husband's Idaho property, um, and they've been identified as seven-year-old Joshua J.J. Vallow and 17-year-old Tylee Ryan. Obviously, we know that they've both been missing since September. If you've been listening to our podcast for a while, we've been talking about this case. And very sadly, they have located the kids now. And it was what I think a lot of people might have thought was had happened. But now it's confirmed. I'd actually just somewhere in the back of my mind just hoped they were in some like bunker somewhere being kept because they genuinely thought the world was ending and they'd be safe so they weren't going to tell anyone but unfortunately that was not it so the family said in a statement this is the worst news we will ever get in our lives the woodcocks and the ryans are confirming that human remains found by law enforcement at chad daybell's property are indeed our beloved jj and tylee we are filled with unfathomable sadness that those these two bright stars were stolen from us and only hope that they died without pain or suffering Um, Official statements from the Rexburg Police, the medical examiner, and the FBI will be released soon. So we could have a little bit more progress by the time this goes live. But as of now, I'm giving you the most up-to-date information as what we have. So I know in our group chat, I saw on some pictures came through, I thought on Facebook or um, a on Instagram or something, and basically they were searching Chad ba- Daybell's Idaho property, and I um, sent that through, like, oh, no, they've they've, ser- they've served another search warrant, and they're looking at the property, and they um, had aerial shots of it, and it looked like they were digging. So um, that was, I think, two days ago, and then, obviously, they did confirm that they had found them. They started to tear into this backyard, so they'd brought in some equipment to start doing that, so it sounds like they kind of had, they must have had some information which is probably why they got the second warrant and why they started digging and knowing where to look. He was arrested. Wouldn't you, sorry, wouldn't you, if you were concerned about the welfare of these kids, wouldn't you just like run a cadaver dog over it anyway? I think the thing that's is the my, thing is, is my opinion. <laughs> no, I'm totally with you. But yeah. from I've been like reading into this a little bit. And I think that basically they couldn't, 
There's stuff they couldn't do because it wasn't within the scope of the warrant. So when you go to the judge to get a warrant, you have to have probable cause. It has to be to really like, specific. Yes, yeah. We, yeah, I'm sure you know all this, but it has to be really specific. So perhaps they didn't have enough evidence to like actually do all that yet, and they finally got it. So he was actually arrested, and there's pictures of him being taken away from the property. Um, and he has been held in court, and he's faced the um, for a like a bail hearing, and he was his attorney wanted him to be released uh, on a hundred thousand dollar bail. Um, excuse me. Yeah. No. Fuck off. <laughs> yeah. Basically, that was the judge's answer, word for word. Um, no. Uh, <laughs> he's being held on one million dollar bail dollars bail, as Valo is as well. Um, and she's still in prison. I saw this thing. And it was total hearsay, and I could be completely – this could be false, but there were reports that um, – I couldn't actually find, like, a proper source, so I didn't, like, put it down, but I'm going to tell you anyway, that um, when Valo – when Lori Valo found out that her husband was arrested, she, like, trashed her cell and, like, went nuts completely. So mm. I know that there's going to be tons more coming out about this case, and eventually when they go to trial, I'm sure we're going to find out – most you know a lot more especially what um has been happening but i am i'm relieved that at least the family has it's again closure is like not a good word because there's no closure but i mean yeah i was literally just saying this to my mom last night because like this is great dinner time conversation and i was telling her like they they found the bodies um on his property and like on one hand I thought that they would never find the kids because you mm. think of like how much space and even like where they've they've moved around so much like how could you pinpoint where these kids were buried so on one hand it's somewhat of a rel- relief I guess that they could find them and like tell the grandparents and everything like have that not closure like you said but have some sort of understanding of what happened but on the other hand it's like how dumb do you have to be to bury bodies on your property? I don't know. Like that just, I just don't, I don't understand. Mm. I think this is my theory that is backed up with zero evidence. Okay. (laughs) Right. So I was looking at the timeline. Okay. The children went missing in September, Mm -hmm. last thing in September. Chad Dayball's wife died in October. So we know there's not a – they're likely not – have we're not buried on that property in that time, okay? But do you remember back with the – wait, and so then November is when they were married and he married Lori Vallow. And do you remember the um, – I think it was a Datelight episode that they found the storage unit where they have yeah. footage the of them – of the suitcases, of them taking the suitcases out. So my completely – again, based in no fact whatsoever, thoughts are that perhaps she stored the children there and then when it was like, when the wife was gone, they eventually buried them on the property. But again, yes, why on earth would you bury them there? It's also, Idaho's very, like, and I'm sure that area, it's r- rural, rural, I can't, another word I can't say, rural, rural, rural. <laughs> rural, yeah. R- r- rural. Rural. <laughs> rural, rural, rural. Yeah, you think okay. of all the places they've been, and they were, um, I think they were saying the, the the kids were last seen at one of the national parks, and like the, yeah. the sheer size of those places, I like know. I thought we would never, ever know. Mm-mm. Same. So, um, well, I guess whenever we hear or see anything else, we will definitely share it with you guys. So my second story, again, involves another child, which, sorry, this is all a bit terrible. So it's about the Madeline McCann case, and there was a, a big um, news story about the Madeline McCann case last week. Um, German police announced that a 43-year-old German pedophile was being investigated over three-year-old Madeline McCann's disappearance 13 years ago. The suspect has been named in reports as Christian Brukechner. Probably not how you say his name. I apologize. Not to him, just... Yeah, we don't care because people. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, not, I don't apologize to him, but um, yeah, just hate butchering names. Who is in prison on drug offenses and was reportedly convicted for the 2005 rape of a 72-year-old American woman in Portugal last year? This yeah, guy is a piece a of coat. trash. Police said their suspect lived regularly in the um, the area between 1995 and 2007, the year Madeline vanished from her family's holiday apartment in nearby Praia de Luiz. Luiz? I don't know. Praia de Luiz. 
Yeah. Try to lose. Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, Madeline, uh, Madeline's mother, Kate, went to check on her during a meal with friends at nearby tapas restaurants but found the window open and her oldest daughter missing from her bed. Phone records allegedly show the suspect received a call near the McCann's Holiday apartment about an hour before Madeline vanished. German authorities have previously said that they believe that she um, is dead and are investigating the suspect on suspicion of murder. However, though, a German state prosecutor has claimed police in Portugal still believe it's her parents, Kate and Jerry. That's according to the Telegraph, so they don't actually think it's him but the, i guess there must they must have some like further evidence that really the german police like that supports the fact that they think it was him or that he was connected whether he's confessed or something or maybe he confessed to a, another inmate it's been i don't know but um it's this i was I, I know this case we've talked about it before we've never really co- we've never covered it or talked about it there was that documentary like a uh, program on netflix oh, yeah. and it was, there's a, a podcast that? No, we didn't. Did did we? I remember watching it. I think it was last year. Did we review that? Maybe we did. I didn't watch it. So I I'm speaking it. for myself. Because I know it was, uh, yeah, it, was, it was like huge here, obviously, because she was a small British child. And I remember yeah. having, having, watching the documentary, I remember having a lot of feelings about privilege and stuff. And that kind mm. of really overshadowed, overshadowed a lot of it. But again, just as we were talking about the Valo case, thinking we'd never find this these children that's basically what's happened with madeline mccann yeah exactly but yeah so two horrific um cho- you know instances with children going you know not uh going sorry i can't speak <laughs> <laughs> going missing or abducted and yeah it's not a good outcome i always find i think we've we've all talked about this before like the madeline mccann case and because being in england Every now and then it'll come out that they are going to put another million pounds towards the investigation. And I'm, you know, yeah. and okay, I have a child and obviously maybe I don't know what I'm talking about um, because that hasn't happened to me. But you do not, I don't understand the amount of money after, even after time goes on and on and on and on that they continue to put forward to it. Like I said, it. It's been 13 years. Yeah. And, and it's not um, my child. They, so. Yeah. Unless they really believe that there is. A solid link and they do need this funding to finish this case then fine great yeah find the people who who abducted her and potentially allegedly who knows murdered her if she is dead great but i just feel like at the moment there's a lot more money there's a lot more places that money could go to do a lot more good and i'm really sorry that i'm saying basically like fuck this child and i'm not saying that i just feel like these are huge amounts of money it's not yeah. we're not talking like a couple of thousand pounds here, like you said, it's like a million pounds there and it's like whoa, that's a lot. I just You think that maybe that money could be used in uh more recent cases where maybe there's more mm. of a chance of mm. of some sort of outcome? Because yeah, with this one it almost feels like you're throwing money down a very dark well and not really going anywhere. Which is horrible because it is it I mean it's a girl. It's a child, and, yeah. Yeah, I can't imagine. I don't I can't even imagine but yeah you think maybe perhaps that money could be used on other cases more maybe more recent cases that sort of stuff yeah and I guess we always sort of weren't sure with it being a I think they were quite they were you know an upper middle class family an upper middle class white family and Mm. it was just like I wonder if all of this would have resources would have been thrown at somebody who you know, maybe wasn't the same. I think we always, you, we run into that quite a lot um, with some cases that become incredibly um, sensational, like all over the media, all this attention. And you're like, well, if it was just somebody who was maybe a minority family from a lower income area would. Yeah, or a single mom or something. Or a single mom yeah. who is on maybe benefits or, you know. Yeah, it's just, it's, again, we start, don't want to get too, like, political about it, but it's just, um, I don't know. But I guess we'll find out, maybe we'll find out further if the German police seem to think they're really onto something and they're investigating it, so you never know that we will possibly hear more. And I have one more little thing I was just going to tell you guys because I read it. I did not write any sources down for this, but I just read it before I was podcasting, and so obviously, you know, Carol Baskin, let's get a little Tiger King update. 
Mm -hmm. um, was given, was awarded the zoo, um, Joe's zoo. And that was because he technically owed, um, she had won all the money for like, um, when he took her name and did all that. What was that? Like, what was that? What is that called legally? Like, the defamation. The de- was it defamation? I wasn't really. I couldn't remember exactly. Anyway, so the um, he she's got the zoo now, and and so he's been writing letters about how he prison is horrible, and um, you can imagine. I think he's hating the fact that he's in prison and he's super famous now, which is all he ever wanted. And so he was <laughs> writing to see if he could get the attention of and be pardoned. He wanted to get the attention of Kim Kardashian West. <laughs> Oh, Are you no. joking? <laughs> yeah. Are you joking? Kim, no. don't do it. Don't do it, Kim. Yeah, so... Um, you should really be writing to, like, Britney Spears. Because didn't Jeff Lowe, like, to provide her with that boa constrictor? Oh, no, that was That's the other true. guy with the ponytail. Oh, no, did he? Did Jeff Lowe do the boa constrictor? Oh, no, it was the tiger. He had a tiger in the background in the video. Some, yeah, one of them. Yeah. I mean, surely he should whole... be writing to someone like that. Not exactly. Kim Kardashian West. I don't know. I, just... I would watch, actually. I would watch Britney Spears, The Justice Project. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, God. I would watch that. That poor woman. <laughs> poor Britney Spears. Well, I think she'd be great. <laughs> she just doesn't always seem to be all there when she's... Did you just see that thing where she set her gym on fire because she left candles and burnt it down and she had a video like, hi, yeah, so um, just in the gym, um, I burned it down <laughs> because I love some candles. Britney Spears... She has such a soft spot in my heart. That whole story I know, could, same, could be that same. could be a true crime one hundred and one in the way that her father has abused her realistically yeah, yeah, and horrific. has uh, like control of all her assets and everything. So that in itself is is its own thing. But Britney Spears is so fascinating to check in on every once in a while. I saw the um, fairly recently she posted how. Her time to run like 100 meters or something was like five seconds, which is faster than Usain Bolt. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, it's like girl, oh, I mean, if you're saying you're faster than Usain, then I believe you. But <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my God. Bless her heart. I've always oh. loved her because I, she's literally my – She's, I think she's only a year or two older than me. And she, she like her height of fame um, hit me baby one more time. I just remember like – practicing the dance moves i think it was in high school yeah we were in high school still doing that shit yeah um so i've always just like had a spot like a soft spot for her i mean it's just i just can't imagine what growing up in the the you know in that life does to you yeah free britney <laughs> that was a britney spears tangent and i loved it <laughs> I, i'm just i'm gonna find i a really way. enjoyed that <laughs> Decided I'm going to find a way to bring up Kim Kardashian West in every single episode I can. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a little bit different to what we normally review, but I feel like it will resonate very strongly with a lot of people, and by that I mean namely our British listeners. So this week we're reviewing the podcast The Walker's Switch. So this is a six-part podcast by Augustine Surf and Lauren Peters and explores the colour of Chris Packets or chip packets for my North American friends. Thank you. So if I showed... We're going to call them crisps from now on because they're crisps. <laughs> okay. Um, so if I showed either of you a packet of crisps in a green packet, what flavour would you hazard a guess at them being? Cheese and onion. Cheese and onion. Cool. Yep. And blue blue packet? Salt, Salt vinegar. vinegar. Cool. So um, we'll bear that in mind because it's important in a minute. So Walker's is one of the most well-known brands in the UK and Ireland. They are best known for making crisps or chips. They have a production facility in Leicester, which makes 11 million bags of crisps a day. Oh, my God. Good guy. Um, using 800 tonnes of potatoes, which is probably the amount of crisps I've eaten in lockdown. <laughs> so whilst founded in 1948 in, in Leicester by a man named Henry Walker, they're now owned by PepsiCo, who also own Lay's, which I think is mm. a popular... Cri- Crisp it brand is. in the US, yeah, yeah, in, yeah, yeah. In the US, Canada, yeah. So, um, the most popular flavors of crisps in the UK that Walkers produce are ready salted, cheese and onion, salt and vinegar, and prawn cocktail. So, the issue being investigated in this podcast is whether Walkers in the early 90s swapped the colors of their cheese and onion crisp packet with the colors of their salt and vinegar crisp packet. So, in the UK, Walkers crisps have their cheese and onion in a blue packet and salt and vinegar in a green packet, which is against everything that is holy in this life. Um, it, it's against the norm, isn't it? Mm. It's, it's, it's an yeah. odd. 
Yes. It's very like standardized as in, okay, so ready salted is red. Right. It's always red, yeah. right? Prong cat yeah. always pink. So across mm-hmm. all the brands, you just know. So you grab it. You just know what you're going to get, except for walkers. Those sneaky fuckers. <laughs> I, yeah, I have I have um, strong feelings on this. And I'll tell you why in a minute. So many people remember and firmly believe, and I'm talking, I will die on this hill, believe. <laughs> like, I will swear on someone's grave, believe that the colours were changed in the early 90s, with some believing that there was even an ad campaign by walkers involving football and people wearing the wrong shirts about this colour change. So, in fact, the podcast notes that two out of three people believed this switch occurred. However, there is a section on the FAQs of Walker's website which clearly states that this is wrong. They have never swapped the colours of their crisp packets and they've always used blue for green, uh, blue for cheese and onion and green for salt and vinegar. And this is part of their signature branding. Um, there was never any advertising because this simply didn't happen. So uproar, outrage, disgust, definitely all feelings that I felt because I do remember, or at least I think I remember, them changing the packaging. My name is Hannah and I'm a Switch Believer. <laughs> <laughs> I have listened to almost the entire podcast. I have my last lep- ep- I have one episode left. But I mean, I really can't say because I wasn't here then. <laughs> so I can't really have an opinion because I wouldn't remember it because I wasn't living in the UK. But they make a good case. Mm. It's so fascinating, too, because I actually did a YouTube video a long time ago um, where I bought a whole bunch of salt and vinegar flavored snacks. So there was crisps there were like nuts there were um like all sorts of random stuff but it all had to be salt and vinegar and I was gonna like rank it and I remember I got so many comments on that video specifically about how yes blue is the traditional salt and vinegar but that walkers originally were blue and switched it like it was a whole big conversation on that video specifically about how they switched it and of course, I had no idea. Like I'm like, okay, yeah, sure. They switched it. That makes sense. Yeah. Like, okay, but yeah, there are people in there that firmly believed and told me the truth that what they thought was the truth that walkers switched their colors. It's true. It's true. But you know, it's, apparently it's not. So my life is a lie. Anyway, the hosts <laughs> go so far as to stalk. Um, uh, I mean, track Gary Lineker down. Who's <laughs> that was quite, my favorite episode. A, so funny. <laughs> he's a, if for those who don't live in the UK, he's quite a famous English footballer, and he's been the face of the company since 1995. Um, to ask him, you know, did this happen? Gary is a switch believer. Oh, um, he's even yeah. quoted a saying. Plot twist. He even yeah, he's quoted a saying. Everyone knows it happened. Oh my god, this is like a collective hallucination. It's bananas. It's so, a conspiracy. Um, yeah, they, they go on to explore fan theories, a potential Tory party plot, um, and how this could be linked to the Mandela effect. They even interview people purportedly connected to the Illuminati. That was awesome. Which is a questionable <laughs> section. They interview a Google employee about whether or not it would be easy for images of the old packaging to be wiped from the internet and how close brands' relationships with Google are. They interview a criminal barrister about memory. It does get a bit silly and a little bit far-fetched in places, but that is like my only criticism. And I can't decide whether or not they are being serious, like, or whether this is a fucking great job at a parody of real investigative journalism. So The Guardian, I read a review on The Guardian about it, and it was reviewed as, it's like cereal for crisps. Like cereal, yeah. the, the hit podcast series, <laughs> but for crisps. I thought the podcast was brilliant. And there was one, one section in it which made me snort with laughter which I know a lot of other people probably won't find funny. But there's one part where one of the hosts calls a former Conservative Party member to talk about the like the Tory plot about these crisps. Oh and god, it's so funny. She speaks <laughs> to she the speaks secretary. to a personal she speaks to this man's personal assistant. <laughs> and she is the world's rudest personal assistant. And like I'm a personal assistant. That's what I do for a living. I'm great at my job because I am fantastic. But if I ever spoke to anyone like that, my boss would rip me in half. Like, she would murder me. She would murder me. Even if somebody called you asking about... What's his name? John Adam... What's his name? The, uh, t- the, the Wasn't he, like, prime minister at some point? Was it? No, he was, like, an advisor. He but was he called was, like... Chris, even I know who he is. He was called Chris something. 
Is that oh no, I thought she called. Um, oh. No, the oh the the big I guy. Know you mean. Yeah, I forgot. Sorry. Um, no, she called Chris P. Oh, did she? Oh fuck! You're gonna have to cut this out. Sorry, it's horrific. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so, yeah, but she she was just like the rudest personal assistant, and I was just like. I was I went out for a walk and I was like cackling to myself, like a like a mad woman walking through a park cackling to myself. So um, if you watch it, just watch it. Like, if you listen to it, listen to it for just that section. So, it was really yeah. <laughs> oh it was, my god! I thought it was a great podcast. It gets as I said, it gets it gets a bit silly in places. But Anna, you've listened to some of it. What do you think? Oh, that. But yeah, going back to that one interview, that was hilarious because they were almost kind of la- the ladies like, can you put that in writing, please? That was funny. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, I listened to it. It was, uh, it was really, it, it is silly. It's the whole thing's silly because it's taken. I think it is part parody. Sl- I, I don't know if it's a parody or if it's just one big like sort of. I don't know. I don't know. I know what you're trying to say. You can't tell if they were actually trying to be a parody or if they were just like having some fun. But it is really, it's very funny. It's very light. It's very, it's, it's actually. I'd love it if the two of them did a serious topic because they are excellent podcasters, I thought. I thought they did a really good job. Yeah, they're brilliant. The, the production was good. I like their, you know, even the music at the start. You you know, I thought they did a great job. It would be great to see them actually do like a serious project, to be honest. So what would you guys rate it out of five? Oh, five. <laughs> I mean, it basically highlighted the fact that memories that I believe that I have are a lie. Um, <laughs> however, five, it was great. I think it was great. Yeah, I would say... I'll give it like a four. I think it's great. It's it's not well. I would actually let me change that. I would give it a five in the fact of for what it is. Like they do it well. They do it really, really, really well. Um, but it's not like you have to be in the right mood to listen to it. Like if you're like want to just you're you're not gonna listen. To, it's not serious. You know, it's <laughs> not a serious sub- subject matter. But it's very light and so, and it was good because I was I was listen- finishing like um, listening to a, finish a couple episodes today and I was just like laughing away like it's just great it's a nice light listen so I say especially I don't know that it will mean anything to anyone outside the UK in fact I don't yeah. think it will at all but if you're a UK listener check it out you'll love it Get, yeah also if you remember the switch then can we form some sort of support group I think this is the best I'm very rated, upset. best rated <laughs> podcast you guys have done in a long time well, finally we need, one we needed something light we need yeah <laughs> finally something in lockdown that we don't hate yay walkers <laughs> we did it <laughs> so next up in our review section we're going to be talking about the new podcast by dateline nbc called motive for murder did either of you guys listen to any of it yes i finished it yeah i did the whole thing oh nice okay so motive for murder is the second sort of serialized podcast from Dayline Embassy. Uh, Their last one was The Thing About Pam, which I loved so much. Thing About Pam was absolutely fabulous. This one is uh, narrated by Josh Mankiewicz, who I also love. Not a Keith, I have to say. Not a Keith. Also, did you guys know Keith Morrison is Canadian? We'll talk about that at another point. What? Yeah. I thought he was an American national treasure. I feel lied to. Absolutely. What is this episode? Absolutely we are just exposing not. all sorts of shit today. Exposed. <laughs> <laughs> so Josh is wonderful. He does the narration and sort of like the storytelling for Motive for Murder. Uh, right off the bat, I didn't like it as much as the thing about Pam, but it was still a good listen. Like it, it's high quality. It's from Dateline. You kind of know what to expect. At this point, I almost almost exclusively listen to Dateline because because I'm stuck in a lockdown and I need my soothing Dateline. So I figured I'll do a, like a really basic synopsis so there's no spoilers in case you guys want to listen to it and then we'll just do like a little bit of spoilers but I'll let you know at that point. So basically this particular story follows two murders which happened just months apart in Houston, Texas. The two young victims know each other and ask the question, did they also know their killer? Is there some sort of connection? Because the two the two victims had some type of relationship together. Did they know who killed them? So the main premise behind the podcast is trying to figure out the motive, obviously. Hashtag motive for murder. <laughs> and Josh talks about how typically motives ha- are one of three options. 
either love, money, or pride. And pretty much most motives can be slotted into one of those categories. I thought it was interesting that they they look at the story from a motive perspective. So it really focuses on like why, like why would these people be killed? Maybe less so on the evidence of some podcasts, like they really focus on like the evidence collecting. And there is that in this as well, but it really does focus on why would these people be killed? What type of motive are we looking at? Um, so I thought that was interesting and it, just a different um, perspective. So there's six episodes. They're anywhere from 20 to 50 minutes, which is kind of strange. Some of them tend to be like 20, 25 minutes. I think it's the last one ends up being 50 minutes. It's pretty easy to listen to. um, So you can just sort of pop it on while you're doing stuff. The only thing that I found was I listened to one episode each week when it was getting released. But by the time the next episode came around, I kind of forgot like, the relationships of people because there are quite a lot of people involved so I guess the only thing I would say that if you are interested maybe listen to it a bit faster now that all the episodes are out the the only thing that kind of killed me was because I have <laughs> listened and watched so much Dateline I already knew this story which was a Dateline episode um oh. and it 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 is a crazy one, so I can see why they picked it, but it was kind of like when I was listening to the first episode and it starts sort of laying out the the first crime, and I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> God damn it, I've seen this one. <laughs> but it had been a while, thankfully, and I still didn't know like all the details because as you can imagine, there's a lot more details in this than one hour of a Dateline episode. So that's your basic synopsis. We're going to get in just to a little bit of spoilers. I'm not going to like retell the whole story because it's actually quite complicated. But the the twist, if anybody's still listening, <laughs> is so we have one woman, Gella Ray, who is shot in her car and they have no idea why. Um, the only real uh, lead they have is that she was quite... A spokesperson and a protester against the Iranian government and so there's kind of like a little bit of a conspiracy but it doesn't really make sense you know she's a young woman in Texas like why would the Iranian government kill her over protesting then they have another murder so Gellaray's boyfriend's twin brother is murdered so there's there's quite a close connection between those ones and Um, Not that it matters at all. His name is Cody. Um, It's spelt with a T. Just putting that out there. Like Cody. I thought thought it was Cody. Cody. I thought so as well. And then I was reading stories and it says, so Corey Corey Beavers is Galloway's boyfriend. His identical twin brother, Cody, but it's C-O-T-Y. Our accents, the way we pronounce our T's, like... Water. <laughs> like we say, yeah. we pronounce our T's as more like that D. If I, yeah, if I saw that on paper, if I saw that name on paper, I'd say Coty. Coty, yeah. Yeah, like Kit's Coty. Well, it, anyway, he is tragically <laughs> murdered. Sorry, Cody. And his wife, Nezreen Irsan, I really struggle with the last name. Nezreen, though. She calls 911 that uh, he's been shot. He dies. So they're all connected some way and the, the whole podcast looks at you know why like why 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 would these people be shot dead it turns out which is absolutely bonkers that Nazarene's father had either killed or had them killed because they had some sort of connection with his daughter Nazarene and he was a controlling strict abusive figure and wanted to to kill them and it's it i remember watching it on dateline and being like what the fuck Mm -hmm. like you never you never see that type of motive in a dateline episode it's almost always like someone was having an affair and the husband killed his ex-wife or whatever like all that kind of stuff but no it was actually the father who who killed both of them or at least had somebody they think the son uh he had the son kill both of them and it also comes out that the father killed one of his daughter's son-in-laws hmm. in the 90s 
and claimed mm. it was self-defense, but they then looked back into that, and it's just like it's he's a horrible shocking. man. Just, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And listening to his interview because he gets because inter- actually Michael Josh goes in and interviews him, and he's just like horrible and angry and. Even he was saying, like, he's interviewed a lot of people in prison, but this guy was just, you know. Yeah, they actually even say, at least in in the podcast and in the article, I'll post those sources on our website. But in 2018, jurors spent 35 minutes deliberating um, against the father and convicted him of both murders of Gellaray and of Cody. And they said that during the penalty trial of the fate of during during the penalty phase of the trial, a former neighbor said that the father had bragged to him that he, quote, got away with murder in the death of his other son-in-law. Quote, he said he invited his son-in-law to his house and shot him, the witness testified. He said he shot him with a 12-gauge shotgun and planted a gun on him to make it look like self-defense. So, um, he just is, I mean, evil. He's evil. Yeah, he's an evil man. It's terrifying, isn't it? Really is terrifying. What's interesting too is they talk about the the parents a little bit throughout the podcast, and so you you are aware of them, and then you get the twist like, oh, by the way, that person we've been mentioning off and on is actually like this evil mastermind that had three people killed essentially. Yeah, it's wild. It's I think the thing it's still it's like really well done, well produced. The story is still good, but I think the thing um. What was it called? The thing about Pam? Yeah, the mm. thing about Pam was just so bonkers that it's gonna it's gonna be so hard to ever live up to that sort of like just plot line like story just yeah. because it was so nuts. So I think to get that shock effect is still always gonna be <laughs> difficult. But I thought it was like great. That was great. I mean, I love Dateline too. I listened to some of the Dateline. I can put Dateline. Um, the episodes on the the podcast I, I put them on sometimes just when I just need like a story to listen to and follow that is just yeah. easy yeah they I mean it's all it's good production quality yeah I was really excited for it on two points which Alana's has already covered in the something about Pam was brilliant or the thing about Pam was brilliant but the uh, the other thing that kind of like drew me to it and the other thing I was kind of excited about was the fact that it wasn't being narrated by your boy <laughs> Dean, um because I still think he's got a spooky voice I can see why you might say that, but I yeah. also know that you are wrong. Yeah. That's fine. I mean, we can agree to disagree. We agree to dis- disagree, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I thought it was good. I thought maybe the story was a little bit padded in places. Yeah, um, they, they drew it out, didn't they? Yeah, I think that's just because they were trying to make it into a six-part podcast. They probably could have done four parts and just made yeah. them a bit yeah, longer. Just, yeah, released it all at once. That or released really it good. all at once. Yeah, yeah. If they re- that, it was kind of like that. I think you're right. I think it is one that they could have released all at once or yeah. just condensed it to four parts. But the like, inconsistency on length of episodes, was I found that really strange because I was yeah. there's one where it, one came out and I was like, oh, I'll download that, then I'll go out and do this. And I downloaded it and it was like 20 something minutes and I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could listen to it twice. <laughs> um, yeah. But no, I thought it was it was good. And with Josh Mankiewicz giving his opinion on things like closure, um, it added like a little bit more to the story, which was kind of like a nicer touch, I think. That was good. That was a good point, actually, he made about closure. You don't really get closure. Yeah. Yeah, and interesting that we literally were just talking about it at the beginning. He does talk yeah. about how he hates the word closure and there's no such thing. So he doesn't like stories when they end, you know, and the families get closure because that's not a real thing. And him working with Dateline for so long, he knows like none of this is going to like it won't change anything. Everybody is still traumatized and closure shouldn't be a word that they use. And and yeah, I thought that was really interesting. And it does give almost like more of a behind the scenes look at a Dateline episode because they do talk with like the producers of the show and some of like the researchers, like they went out and interviewed so-and-so and and they talk about that. So it's almost like an extended Dateline episode, but with like behind the scenes aspects. But yeah, it is hard because the thing about Pam was probably one of my all-time favorites. And so it's hard Mm -hmm. to come after that, but I still think it was really good. Yeah. I agree. I, I think I'll probably always listen to anything they put out, if I'm honest. Yeah. Yeah. The, like, production quality is fantastic. Yeah. So it's definitely yeah. worth it. And it's usually some sort of interesting – like, it's not not an interesting story. Yeah. So, yeah. What would you guys rate it out of five? 
I'd give it like a four. Um, Anyone else? <laughs> yeah, no, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah, I would say like, I would say 4.5. Because, like, mm-hmm. it's great. It's, like, st- the standard's always good. It's always really high. It's not like it's the most insane story or anything like that. But it's just, it was good. It's good. It's a good listen, I think. Listen. I'd probably go 4.5 as well. I think the only thing that was kind of annoying was in some parts it did feel a little bit padded out. Because it's, like, the story is crazy. And there's a lot of, you know, different aspects and things. But they probably could have shaved a bit off. So, yeah, but 4.5, I thought it was really good. I would definitely recommend it to people who want a a new story. Weird Crime Time. This week for Weird Crime Time, we're going to Spain. Um, Alana shared this on the group chat and um, I stole it for this section, so I'm really sorry. (laughs) Yes! (laughs) I'm so sorry. I'm not sorry, I do what I want. Um, So, last July, a photographer named Jose Luis Abad died at the home of a well-known Spanish porn star, um, Nacho Vidal. Following an 11-month inquiry into the death, Vidal was arrested, together with two others, on suspicion of manslaughter and, quote, crimes against public health, close quotes, which sounds terrifying. So I know what a lot of people are thinking. Did someone drown in a pool? Did someone get attacked? No. Jose died from a heart attack after inhaling a pipe filled with dried toad venom during a, quote, mystic ritual, close quote fascinating so now my only knowledge of frog venom comes from a late 90s episode of jonathan creek but after a swift google i found out that dried venom of the bufo alvarius or colorado river toad um, is often smoked to elicit a psychedelic experience i've never sounded more white in my life have i <laughs> jesus christ um so whilst using toad venom has been used medicinally and as part of ancestral rituals for many years there was a big spike in popularity for it last year and there was a study last year published that said that it could potentially ease anxiety and depression for a short period of time well yeah because you're out of your freaking mind <laughs> you don't know where you are how can you be anxious I know. sucking on a toad going outside <laughs> so um vidal and two others have been released provisionally with vidal's lawyer stating that he was quote very upset by the death of this person end quote but quote with all due respect to the dead man and his family nacho maintains that the consumption was completely voluntary end quote now have either of you heard about fucking toad venom no i i live a very sheltered life i don't ever want to lick a toad i have uh oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'm gonna set the scene here. Okay, it's a uh, it's Christmas. No, it's Boxing Day, which for North Americans that's a day after Christmas, um, which is like a big day in the UK. Um, it's just like the Christmas celebrations. It's like Christmas Day too. It's great. So I have a friend over in her family for boxing day she's a a fellow american and we've been friends for a long time and she's there my daughter's really small then so she was like i don't know if she's like one or something she was really little and her kids are there and you know it's us just we're just celebrating we're having a great day so she was married so this is her ex-husband which is the only reason i'm telling you guys this story so i feel like it's legal it's fine um (laughs) so he's like you know he's a nice guy i don't have anything horrible to say about him but he's like really into sort of um I don't know he's sort of you know into some stuff (laughs) and then we have my husband which you both know who is the most straight-laced man (laughs) you know what his job I mean you can't get more just like down the middle clean cut (laughs) yeah dude you know what I mean so yeah that's him so they get into a conversation my friend's ex-husband, where he's like, yeah, you know, man, I went to the ceremony and, you know, we all just like loosened up. We just thought we would take some like, you know, toad venom. I don't know exactly know what he called it, but he's like, yeah, you should try it. Do you want to come with me? You want to try it sometime? Do you want to do it? And <laughs> apparently he ended up getting all like violently ill. Like he was like throwing up with it, whatever. He's like, but it was the best experience. It was so spiritual and like talking about how it like changed his life. He's like, can you come out the other side? And you're just like, this. again, picture my husband, Mr. Oh, no. Freaking, you know, you know, Will. But and he's like, you know, he would have been so polite about it. And you exactly. Been like, no, thank you. Bye. <laughs> yeah. So he's sitting there like, what the actual fuck oh. <laughs> is he going on about? And um, yeah. So um, it's just like he's he's. Yeah. 
<laughs> anyway, they're not together anymore, not because of the toad venom, but just like, you know, it just didn't work if out. If ever but, there um, was a reason to, to divorce, it would be toad venom. <laughs> yeah, bless his heart. Um, Don't they call yeah. it like smoking the toad? Smoking the toad. Oh t- my God. I saw that on an article and I nearly wet myself laughing. Oh my God. Guess what? <laughs> That's the title of this podcast. Yes, it is. <laughs> the toad. <laughs> Excellent. Not just this episode, our entire podcast. Just we're gonna change the name from Murder Friends. Fucking hell. Anyway, it, the funny thing is, you put that in the like the group chat about like, oh god, like this, look at this crazy freaking story, and I was like, dude, I got I, like I know about this. Like, <laughs> like you put it in the group chat, and my number one question was, do they lick the toad directly, <laughs> like, and all yeah. in capitals. <laughs> And it was really was a sentence I didn't think I'd ever have to type out or one that I would ever demand an answer to of my friends. <laughs> you know, what I, my thought at that moment was if somebody ever like found my phone and like saw the shit that we said to each other, the three of us, <laughs> between heinous murders and just the weird crap like that we talk about, they'd just be like, what is wrong with these women? And just so many gifts. Yeah. So many gifts. I mean, of course, obviously you guys know that there were toad gifts that followed – there were licking gifts. It was just like a yeah. whole, you know. I don't ever want to do that. No. Can we just like say aloud here? I'm going to just make a promise to our listeners now. A declaration. Yeah. We're not going to We're not gonna smoke any toad. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's all we have for today. Check out our website for all of our sources at murderfriends.com. Dot com. You can email us at murderfriendspod at gmail.com. Follow us on Instagram, murderfriendspod, Twitter, murderfriendspd. And we'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye. Bye.